morning, everybody. They're going to give me another chance, hoping I can get it right this time. So uh, this is all. I'm just reading out of your announcement. Most of you can read this, so but I'm picking up for the rest of you that can't. All right, so if you look at that, it says piano funds. We would like to thank all of you who contributed to the piano fund. You've done it now. Because of your generosity, we can officially say the piano is paid off. Yay, good job, all of you. Thank you so very much. Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Good job. We appreciate that. Uh, Youth Worship Festival, Common Ground Ministries of Vancouver uh, is putting on a week-long worship festival for youth ages 13 to 19. It's an overnight camp, August 9th to 11th. Admission price, it says, is $25, but that's a big lie. Somebody came up with some money and they paid all that off. So there's no admission. And Gene said, big-hearted Gene, if that isn't the way it is, he'll pay for it. So he's a great guy. I love this. Uh, and it's August 9th through 11. He knows when to volunteer. He knows when to volunteer. That's exactly right. Converge by Transform Northwest this year, August 7th to 11th. Wednesday and Thursday will be dinner at 6 p.m. and service at 7 p.m. at Hillcrest Church of the Nazarene with Brett Brett Rickey as the guest speaker. The finale will be an all generation service on Sunday with food trucks from six to seven and a good old fashioned tent meeting. Oh, I've never been to one of those. Both on the farm. Um, the address is there and if you need more information, uh, there's a website there as well, Donna, you'll probably want to look at that. So marriage date night, uh, Friday from 6 to 8.30. Apparently you can go there and get a date. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> also at Hillcrest is marriage date night for $49 per couple with Christian artists, comedians, and speakers. Tickets are BOGO. So you can invite other couples to go with you. Well, that'd be exciting. Oh, and then save the date. August 19th to the 22nd is VBS. Hello. We're registering for VBS now to learn the difference between what the world says is true and what God says is true. Uh, the theme this year is Breaker Rock Beach, where we will find out all about how God's truth is our rock. We will be raising money to provide clean water to children in Tanzania. That sounds like a great idea. I wouldn't like to be without clean water. The kids will have so much fun. There will be a worship rally, Bible lessons, arts and crafts, games, and more. Tell all your family, your friends, people you don't like, neighbors, and coworkers with kids, anybody. Brian, pay attention. We will have a volunteer meeting. Oh, that's past. It says July 21st. If you missed the volunteer meeting, you're out of luck. All right. So that is pretty much everything I have highlighted on this. So I think I'm done. Did you have something to say? Good. We'll pray now. Father God, we just love you so much. This is such a great day you've provided for us. And so exciting, the things that we hear that's happening at your church. We pray, Father, that you would be with us now, that you would be with Paula as she presents the message. What a, what a great opportunity we have to catch up with Paula. And thank you for so many wonderful things that you've been doing for us and helping us all along the way. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A little confusion there. Pastor John and Pastor Rebecca and... Pastor Grady, both gone. We're happy that Paul is here. And uh, so I'm up here, and we're going to pray over the offering. Amen. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, you bless those who have faithfully, Lord, supported this church, Lord Jesus. And we ask, Lord, you blessing on the offering. In your name, amen. amen. The love of God 
is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child and he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich in how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When years of time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who refuse to pray, and hills and mountains call. God's love so sure will still endure all measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and angels Thank you, Jim, for that song. It is good to be here this morning. Let's all stand as we sing this. It's on page 40 in the hymnal. If you'd like to look it up in your hymnal, on page 40, we praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. We praise Thee, O God, our Redeemer, Creator, in grateful devotion our tribute we bring. 
we lay it before thee, we kneel and adore thee, we bless thy holy name and glad praises we sing. We worship thee, God of our fathers, we bless thee. Though life, storms, and tempest are guide, thou hast been. When perils o'ertake us, thou wilt not forsake us. And with thy help, O Lord, life's battles we win. With voices united, our praises we offer, and gladly our song of true worship we raise. Thy strong arm will guide us, our God is beside us, and to thy great Redeemer forever be praised. I thought a lot of you would know that song a little bit better than I thought, so, but that's okay, you may be seated. How many of you heard that song before? There's a few. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me king of all days oh so highly exalted in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created all for love's sake became poor so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together one. my God, you're all together worthy, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Exalted far above all 
changed (laughs) so if you've been expecting a more mature grown-up me not gonna happen (laughs) okay so we're gonna do this is gonna this is why this is technology things gonna make sense if my husband comes running in here and hands me some papers that's my sermon because right now I have this version and I have this version, <laughs> which is just pictures of the computer screen. And this will all make sense I mean, as soon as you hear the title of the sermon. I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. And in my experience of teaching and preaching, God kind of likes you to live it before you preach it and teach it. And so I thought I had what you'll hear in, in, in the introduction But he thought, let's just throw in a little bit more for good measure to keep her humble. So I'm going to remain humble. So I'll start with the introduction. So 
<coughs> excuse me, and I'm recovering from pneumonia. I'm, I'm done with it, but the cough decided to stay, hang around for vacation. So Jerry and I have, uh, met a couple just under two years ago, and um, they've become very quick friends with us. But not long ago, my friend said to her husband, and I quote, it's a good thing that we're believers and don't believe in karma, dear. She always calls her husband dear. It's really cute. Um, and don't believe in karma, dear. Because ever since we've known the Johnsons, it's been one thing after another after another. And if, if I believed in karma, I'd say we couldn't be friends anymore because she's afraid it's going to rub off on them. So, and that's kind of, the whole thing's kind of true. So, in, since they've known us, in the just under two years, going to go really quick, we've had two of our parents die. Jerry had major surgery where they removed a whole row of bones out of his hands. He loves to tell the story, so if you don't want to hear it, don't make eye contact. Um, he, then he fell off a ladder and broke, a, broke his pelvic bone a couple weeks after that. And then he had a one-week hospital stay, and then he had a... Uh, be, what put him in the hospital, he's now having reoccurring issues and illnesses from that. He had an attempted attack on his bus with a, a rider and a skateboard, um, but the plexiglass saved him. Then he almost lost his job a few months after that, no fault of his own, from something else that went on. And then um, he, he still is waiting to hear if he has to have another surgery to deal with the ongoing illness, but, you know, he's waiting for the appointment, you know, that he'll be dead before he gets the appointment. I don't know. Uh, and then I'm still dealing, my dad, one of, my dad was one of the parents. It's been a year and a half, and I'm still dealing with issues of the estate, so that's getting kind of old and boring. Um, <clears throat> I have had recently two bouts of COVID, just getting over pneumonia. Um, I'm having some dental work going on, some procedures, and they keep failing, and they have to keep taking it out and starting over, which I don't like dentists in the first place, and it's very painful, and so that makes me grumpy. And then um, we've had two really serious family situations going on uh, that has been very uh, stressful and, 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 and heart-wrenching at times. But you know what? I'm here to encourage you this morning. <laughs> so... We're not going to just camp out there, right? But in 1970, um, a gal named um, Lynn Anderson had her first hit song. She didn't write it, but it was her first hit song. And, the, and it was called, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. And in the chorus, it's, and I won't sing it because I'm all, you know, flummy and whatever. But I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. And uh, let's see, I know this. Um, along with the sunshine, you've got to, there's, there's got to be a little rain sometime. Okay, so that's that. Now, in other words, she's trying to tell her significant other, dude, it's not all going to be peaches and, and rosy, peachy keen life. Stuff's going to happen. You're going to have to learn how to deal with it. Okay, so that's how she's, what she's trying to get across. So in other words, um, she's just wanting him to know, it's just not all going to be hunky-dory and, and lovely and, and dandy. But um, there, there's a little bit of theological truth in that sassy prose. And so if we look at that chorus theologically, what, what we're saying is God never promised you a rose garden. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you become a Christian, you accept me as your personal savior, and you are going to have rose-colored life. Nothing bad's going to happen. You walk with me, and it's going to be smooth sailing. Has anyone found that verse or passage yet? Please tell me if you have, because I have not, right? And then it also says, you, got, you know, there's got, along with the sunshine, there's got to be a little rain sometime. Well, theologically speaking, that's correct, because... Um, John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace, but in this world you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. So we're going to, take a ver we're going to come back to that verse in a little bit. But according to the sunshine part, I just want to... Uh, hold on. It keeps doing weird things to me. 
Pray that Jerry gets here soon, and then this will all be good. Okay. So first, um, I want us to look at, again, I want to be encouraging. So if we know that God does not promise us a rose garden and that there's going to be rain, <clears throat> we at least, it will help us to understand the why. Why do we have to go through stuff? Why are there going to be? He's not saying you might run into some trouble. He's saying there will be trials and tribulations. Yay! Everybody clap. Everybody clap. It'll make Jerry feel good. Yay. I can put my phone away. Okay. They didn't want to see me. They've been waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, technological difficulties. New computers. Um, off, um, Office Depot doesn't know if they open at 8, 10, or 11 on Sundays. You can check their website, their phone number, and the, 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 door, the, the hours on the door. You're not going to get an answer. So we um, are grateful for this. Thank you. <clears throat> So, let's look at the whys of why we have to face trials and tribulations. One of them is the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Matthew, and I just, I wrote them down because I'd spend all of the sermon time going through the Bible because we were looking at the last scripture today. But Matthew 5.45 from the New Living Testament version says, For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends the rain on the just and unjust alike. So, Within that passage, understanding that a little bit, right now, we are living in a season where um, we're living in God's mercy and his grace right now. Um, so the people that are living righteous lives, big churchy words, right? Just if my kids are out there, they know. Living a righteous life just means you're living right in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, so big word righteous, meaning live right in the sight of the Lord. What is right in the sight of the Lord is righteous, okay? So we're living right in the sight of the Lord. But those who are not living righteously, so again, uh, for those of you that know, I, I've been a children's pastor, and I'm still a kid, right? So what I told the kids was, you want to live a righteous life. You do not want to live a wrongous life, Okay. So if I'm living right, see, they're all nodding. If I live a righteous life, I'm living right in the sight of the Lord. If I'm living a wrongous life, I'm, make, I'm living wrong in the sight of the Lord, and that's not going to be good, right? So right now, we have righteous people and we have wrongous people, right? <clears throat> Both right now are experiencing blessings, and they're experiencing tribulations because we're just living in that era of God's grace. However... It won't be that way all the time because there will be a day where God will separate the sheep from the goats, okay? So don't get mad at me. I'm not calling you a sheep or a goat. God is. So he will separate the righteous from the un unrighteous on the day of judgment. So right now, there's blessings in tribulation, but there will become a day where it's like, mm, you guys did it the way I wanted. You guys wanted to do it the way you wanted to do it. So when we continue on with that verse, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Just a second. Get back on my own. Okay. So <clears throat> don't wait for the day of judgment to get on the righteous side. You have time right now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the first way of why we go through trials is we're living in a period of grace, okay, and mercy from the Lord, but that day is going to end. Another reason why we have to go through the trials and tribulations is to grow our faith. So I want to look at two scriptures on this one, James 1, 2 through 3, can, and it's one you probably, a lot of you know, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So let's look at that first statement. Consider it all joy. So when I was talking with Jerry, he's like, now wait a minute. All joy? Yeah, but that's not how people are going to look at it. Well, I understand that. That's why God's telling you that you need to look at it with all joy. He's trying to set a framework of our mind in 
if you're going through this trial, don't be whining, don't be crying, don't be complaining, don't be, yeah, we're human, right? Our human nature says, I want to whine, I want to cry, I want to complain. But God is trying to switch our framework to say, I know this is going to be hard, and I know you're not going to be jumping for joy, hooping and hollering, but have an attitude of joy. Kind of like, you know, when it says, pray without ceasing, we can't be driving down the road with our eyes closed and our, hands bow, our heads bowed, eyes closed, hands together, driving down the road, praying, because we're not supposed to stop praying. You're to be in an attitude of prayer, an attitude of worship. Okay? So start switching your mind to an attitude of joy when you are going through trials. Not our human nature, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All right. When we continue on with the verse, it says, knowing that testing produces patience. So in the Greek, patience does not mean what we think it might mean. It doesn't mean passive waiting, just hanging out. Okay, I'm praying for patience. I'm learning how to wait. But rather it means active endurance. We're not just sitting around. We're not just waiting for things to get better. We're not wallowing in our despair. But we're choosing to actively remain, to continue on, to pray through, to look for God's work in a situation, and to lean on him for strength. Active endurance. There's not a lot in the Bible where God's just like, yeah, take a break. I've got this. There's a lot in the Bible that says, I've got this, but here's what I need you to do in the meantime. Okay? So we're not off the hook. It's active endurance. Trials we go through reveal the deep faith that we have. God already knows how deep our faith is or not is. But it gives evidence to ourselves and it gives evidence to others around us of the depth of faith that we have. The second verse that I want to look at um, in growing our faith, Romans 5, 3 through 5. We also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Ooh, there's a lot of good stuff in that when you break it down. Okay? So my, my thoughts on here. When you think of perseverance, again, I like to make up words, think of it in terms of, I can get through itiveness. Okay? I can get through itiveness. Having that attitude. And again, we exult in our tribulations. Ah, count it all joy. Exult in your tribulations. Reframing our thinking of why and we're going through it. Okay? When you think of um, perseverance, think of, I can get through it. When you think of proving character, ask yourself, what does my character say about me? What does it say about my morals? What does it say about my mental state? I always like to create word pictures um, because that's just the way my brain works. And so I see so many word pictures in this verse. So when it's saying... Tribulations bring perseverance, and perseverance brings proven character, and proven character hope. And I had them, but I think they're still packed away from when I cleaned out my office. But I have, you know, do you know the Russian stacking dolls? So think of, so I wanted to have them here with me, but think of this word picture. Here I am. I'm facing this tribulation. I'm this little, the littlest one, the smallest one, right? So here I am. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But knowing that I'm going through this, this tribulation is going to bring perseverance. Ooh. So now I take the little one, and I put it in the next one, and I close it up. And now, instead of being this big, I'm this big, right? But patience brings on proven character. So now I'm going to take this one, put it in the next one, close it up. And now, instead of being this big or this big, it's this big, right? But now my proven character produces hope. So now I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to put it in the next one. I'm going to close it up. And now instead of having this one or this one or this one, I'm this. Do you see the, the picture that I'm trying to create? The more that we grow in Christ, the more that these attributes are grown, 
the more that's a picture of what our faith is looking like. That's a picture of our Christian maturity, of what it's looking like. So does that make sense to you? Okay. And so um, <clears throat> if, um, okay. see, I already went through a whole thing of that. But there's also another word picture I want to give you for this verse. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Imagine me with this big, large pitcher of water, nice, cool, clear, clean, cold water, okay? And you're just parched. You've been out in the 100-degree weather. We can all know we've experienced that in the last few months, right? And it's going to get hot today. So imagine just this water, and you're just, you're just dying inside. You're parched. You need refreshment, right? And I come in, and I pour this big pitcher of cold, clean, clear water, and you're opening your mouth, and you're just drinking it in and drinking it in. It's like, oh. Now, imagine you're going through this tribulation. You're going through this hard time, this thing that I didn't ask for. And I just need to be encouraged. I need to be refreshed. I need the strength of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit comes in, and he just pours his love over you. You're just being slathered in his love and just refreshed in his strength. Or, that's the word picture I see. The word picture I don't see is you're going through this hard time and all of this stuff is happening and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes in. Here's my love. Touch it. Dip. Start. You'll get it. That's not the picture that we're getting, is it? It's this big picture of his love being poured. We're being immersed in it. That's what I see when I read that verse. Now, as I would tell my kiddos and my grandkiddos, now that's a yada yav. That's a yada yav. In, in English, that means that's a lot of love. Um, so when our faith is grown, it creates a deeper inner awareness of God's love in us. It's a genuine love. It's a love because it's genuine. Others are drawn to it. Because people, spoiler alert, others know when you're being genuine and you're being fake in your love for the Lord and for them. That one was a freebie. Okay, so now we're going on to another reason why we need to go through um, trials and tribulations. So far, they're good reasons, wouldn't you say? Okay, I can get on board with these reasons. Now, the, the third one is... To strengthen our spiritual muscles. Think of this as resistance training. So um, this was supposed to be like anonymous because I try not to embarrass my family. But I was lovingly surprised this morning. I was going to tell you that one of my daughters just um, had two identical twin boys. And um, <clears throat> they were premature. And so we weren't allowed to hold them. We had to stay away from them all the time because the nurses wanted them swaddled very tightly because they, the, all of their limbs had not matured as they should within the time you know, that they would have had in the womb. So they explained to us when they're all swaddled up, it's like resistance training when they push their little arms and legs out. It's pushing against the womb, and then the womb pushes back, and so it's giving them that... that Strength building. Does that make sense? And so <clears throat> I was also going to tell you pictures are available after the service. But you get to see them live and in person. And I'll help you tell them apart because I finally can most of the time. Um, <clears throat> so it's that resistance training. They need uh, the, the, the pushback. So when hard time comes, our spiritual muscles need to get a workout. We can push back with prayer. We can push back with praise. We can push back with scripture that will encourage us. We can push back with the trust that God's got this. Uh, rather than remaining weak and wimpy, and our walk gets a little weaker and weaker because it's getting a little harder and harder, and it's just, I don't like going to the gym, right? Well, and I don't. <laughs> um, but do I like going to the spiritual gym? Am I spending time? In the spiritual gym, on my knees, okay? 
So it's the same with our regular, our physical muscles and our spiritual muscles. They need that workout, okay? Because when we go through those, those hard times, and if we have weak spiritual muscles, what I did in my younger years is when things got, you know, I, I gave my heart to the Lord when I was how old? How old was I? No, I know you know. I'm asking the kids that have heard this story over and over and over. Over and over and over. I was five years old, okay? Um, and I took it really serious at that age. But still, my faith was growing and growing. And in my mm, 20s-ish, I'd been serving the Lord for a really long time by that time, right? I'm not going to do the math because I'll embarrass myself. I know, 20 minus 5, but whatever. I'm trying to talk loud. Um, and so in my 20s, it's like something horrible would happen. And I'm like, oh, really, Lord, really? This is the thanks I get? I give you my life and I serve you and this happens? And I would run from God because I'd get grumpy with him. But then I'd always come back. And God's big enough to take it, right? As long as you come back. And, um, but now I've learned because I've grown my spiritual muscles, and they're still growing, when things get really hard, that's when I run to God. I used to run from God when it got hard, and now I run to him. Another word picture. And this isn't God. You just walk out on me too many times. You're going to have to figure this one out on your own. That's not the God in my Bible. Every time, my God is in here waiting. Love you just the same. Right? That was an amen right there. All right. <clears throat> so, in 2 Corinthians, it says, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, this is going to sound like I'm talking like an oxymoron here, but just hang with me. My faith is sufficient. Oh, it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, exalt, and exalt, joy, be glad. So most gladly, reframing that mind, therefore I rather boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Okay, so you're telling us to strengthen those spiritual muscles, Paula. And now you're talking to me about, oh, I need to boast in my weakness. Do you want me strong or do you want me weak? Yes. I want you spiritually strong. But when you're in your weaknesses, that's when God's greatness is evident as well. Do you think I was a little bit nervous coming in to preach and I haven't, you know, done so in a little bit and none of my stuff was working and we didn't know. And then the last text I got while Kevin was up here was, yeah, it's not on the thumb drive, so you're going to have to go without it. I'm like, I know it's on the thumb drive. I put it there, right? In that moment, you know what I said to the Lord? I give you my weakness. May your strength be shown in it. Whether I'm reading off the hard, or the hard draft handwritten, which would really get confusing on page that one, because that stuff goes with like three pages later, so that would have been fun, right? And you saw the problem I was having on my phone. But it's like, Lord, we're just going to get through this. Because you didn't promise me a rose garden, but you promised you'd get me through it. Right? So, if you're going to preach it, you've got to live it. So whatever happens, Lord, it's going to happen. But through my weakness, your greatness will be shown. So yeah, we need to have our spiritual muscles strong. But we also need to be willing to give our weaknesses to God so his glory can outshine me. And when I'm weak, I'm not boasting on, I was so good. I knew I had it. I wrote it. I practiced it. I don't need my notes because I'm that good. And what do you think would happen? The Holy Spirit would have come in and just whoo, everything right out of my mind. Oh, we'll show you who's going to get cocky and who's going to get the glory, right? I've experienced that. It's not so much fun. So I like being weak and letting God's strength show, right? Okay, so again, we are to gladly do as required of us. 
The stinking reframing of our mind keeps showing up. So it must be important to God. Another reason we need to go through things is to bring comfort to others. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 says this, Blessed be the God of our Father, of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's a mouthful, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you get all that? It, it's a lot, right? So I'm going to say it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Okay, here's where it gets confusing. Who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who may be going through affliction. And how do we comfort them going through that? With the comfort with which God has comforted us. Full circle. God comforts us. We see someone who needs comforting. We comfort them with our own comfort. No, with the comfort that God comforted us with. Okay? That's what that verse is saying. And again, we see the phrase, God of all comfort. The ancient Greek word, and I'm not a Greekologist, so I'm going to get it wrong, but the word for comfort in the New Testament in Greek is, if I can do it, paraklesis. And if I'm wrong, just go on the computer and ask how do you say it. But I do know what it means. It doesn't mean soothing sympathy kind of comfort. But what it does mean is the idea of strengthening, helping to make strong. Therefore, this verse is saying that God does not sit around soothing us and having sympathy for us. Oh, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I mean, I know why you're going through it, but I'm really, I'm sorry that you do have to go through it. It's not, he's not sitting up there with that kind of comfort. He's sitting up there. All comfort. All strength. All helping. Again, these are all actions. He requires action from us. But he also provides a lot of action for us. Okay? He's not just sitting around saying, you do it all. You, you know, like, you know, the mom that has 10 kids, one to do the laundry, one to do the dishes, one to do the cooking, one to do the toilets, one to, and she doesn't have to do anything, right? She's be the mom that has 10 kids, and like, okay, together, I'm going to do this, and then you're going to do this, and we're all going to work together on this. That's kind of the picture there that I'm thinking. So they're all actions, not just thoughts of feeling sorry or bad for us. And this is what we need to be to others. All comfort in action. Not just, oh, I feel so bad for them. I wonder if there's something I could do for them. Yes, there is. What can you do to help? What can you do to strengthen them? What can you do to be supportive of them? And I can sit around and study and learn all I can about trials and tribulation. What theologically do all the commentaries and theologians say? I can have that knowledge. But until I start experiencing these trials for myself, will I truly understand, oh, this is what God is saying. This is what he's wanting me to do when I put this in action now, okay, now I can go help another. Because what somebody who's going through a hard time does not want are textbook answers. Would you agree? Well, you just need to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Here, let's walk together. Let me go to the grocery store. If you make the list, I'll go to the grocery store for you. Um, why don't you go take a nap and I'll just watch the kids for a little bit so that you can, you know, it's... And then people are going to be more apt to... Um, Accept your comfort if you're willing to put action behind it rather than just tell them about it. Okay? And then another reason we go through trials and tribulations is it brings God glory. So we're gonna, I'm going to read the scripture. We're going to camp out here for a moment. You still get over at 12, right? Not 12, 15, 12, 30. So, my, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. 
I thought you'd be so glad to see me. I could just talk as long as I wanted. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's great. She's mad. Yeah. Okay. I won't do that to you. Psalm 34, 1 through 8 says this. I will bless the Lord at all times. What is with this all times? Happy, good, something, all times. He never gives us a break, right? Reframing our mind. Reframing our mind. Our thought process. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul will make it boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. When should I bless the Lord? All times. You were listening. Good job. Not just the good times, not just the comfortable times, not just times at my discretion, not when only the good stuff is happening at all times. How often should praise be continually? Or I just gave you the answer. How much, how, how, how much praise should be, can be in my mouth? That was an easy A. Okay, not just when I think about it, not just when I'm reminded of it, not just when I feel like it, continually. Base your praise and worship to God. I love this. Base your praise and worship to God on the changeless certainty of who God is, not on your changing circumstances. Ooh, that's a little bit good and a little bit ouch, <laughs> right? So, let me say it one more time. Continually base your, your, uh, your worship. Let me get it right. Okay. Continually base your praise and worship to God on the changeless certainty. Never going to change. Never going to be anything different but what you've come to trust on who God is. He is who he says he is. He does what he says he does. Put it to the test. I'll be right. It's changeless certainty. And don't base it on your changing circumstances. Okay, what should be in my mouth? His praise. Okay, why in my mouth? Why doesn't it say on my lips or something like that? Or, in, you know, in my heart, right? The reason is, if his praise and his worship is in my heart, yes, it needs to be there. And yes, that's a good thing. But if I only keep it in here to myself, how is that bringing him glory? But if it's always in my mouth, I know a lot of people that have something always in their mouth, and I'm not talking about food or snacks. But I'm talking about thoughts and words that they just want to get out and out and out and out and out and out, and they don't stop and they don't stop and they don't stop, and they keep going and they keep going, and they tell you everything that you don't want to know about anything that you didn't want to ever know about. Right? No offense, son. Just no offense. He's feeding the baby. He's not listening. Okay. When it's continually in my mouth, I'm ready at a moment to speak God's praise. Not to cram it down someone's throat, but that it just effortlessly just flows. So when you're talking, remember that genuineness that they respond to? I just, I'm genuine in my praise for the Lord. When somebody, you know, praise the Lord for that. Or God is so good all the time. Somebody told me something this week, and I'm like, and it was kind of like, me. And I'm like, you know what? But God is good all the time. And then I waited for the, all the time, God is good. But they didn't know it. So I had to put that in there. And so, um, but it, just, it was just a natural response that came out of my mouth. It was because it's just, it's just sitting there waiting to come out. Okay. So speak continually your praise from, for, of him for all to hear. Like the, the um, song says, you know, hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Now, they're talking about the light of Jesus, but it can also be about our praise to him, right? Okay. Who should I boast on? Which one? The Lord. Good job, guys. I saw it. They're listening. All right. Not on me. Not on my coping skills, because those aren't so good. Um, how am I handling all this stuff on my own? But how about 
on the Lord. Let's boast on the Lord who's walking through it with me, who's never letting me down, who is there always saying, you've got this, you've got this, I've got you, right? And then what should I request others to join me in? Now, it's been a while since we read it, so I'll give you the hint on this one, right? Magnifying the Lord with us, exalting his name together. I need to draw others into the practice of praise for God's goodness and promise keeping and love. So not only should it be continuously on my mouth, I can help draw others to get comfortable with that as well. Okay? So we've covered the whys. You're like, she's done with that. Good. We've covered the whys of having to experience the hard times in our life. So now let's move on. And these are really important. If we have to go through them, we know why now. But what are some truths that we can hang on to throughout these trials? So you're hanging off the cliff. Again, I'm a, I told you I'm a word picture person. You're hanging off the cliff. You're hanging onto the rope. You're looking down. Your grip's getting a little sore there. What are the truths that are going to help me keep hanging on to that rope? These are the ones we're going to kind of go through quickly. Okay? But I need some part, um, um, congregation participation. Are you good with that? So Yes, I got one person ready and excited. Okay. But I need all of you. Because you if you say it, you believe, I'm usually not into these kind of exercises. But these are so important that I want you, the more you um, stamp it into your mind and your heart, that it is a declaration I want you to say this in a declaration, not, she's making me say this, blah, 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 but blah, 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 because I believe it. You don't have to say that part, just the, the statement that I'm going to give you, okay? So I'm going to read the scripture, and you're going to say, when I'm done, and you're going to say, that's the truth. Not, eh, that's the truth. Eh, I can get on board with that. No, that's the truth, because I'm not, Mike and I had this conversation, right? I'm not saying it. Can't get mad at me. God's saying it. God is saying, here are my truths to hang on to, to get you through those hard times that you know are going to come, that you're going to be okay and happy and joyful about. <sighs> Manny, woo, never gets easier, right? Okay, John 16, 33 says, In this world you will have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, <sighs> happy, happy, for I have overcome the world. Christ, I'll, I'll tell you when it's your turn. Christ overcame the world through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus is the foundation of our peace. He does not abandon. That was really good for our first one, but you're going to get better by the time we're done. Psalm 46.1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Matthew 18 says, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. That's the truth. Exodus 33, 14 says this, and he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. That's the truth. Deuteronomy 32, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is, one, is the one who goes with you. That's the truth. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the truth. Now, the four people that are sitting in the middle right? If God said something once, it's pretty important. Would you all agree? Did we just not hear two verses that are basically saying the same thing? If God says it more than once, he wants you to... No, no, no. These are for the... This is for... This is, it's going to be true what we're going to say, but it's for these four sitting here. They're looking around like they're not going to say it. Okay, I'll give you the first one. He wants you to read it, he wants you to know it. Now, come on, guys. You have fun with this one. And he wants you to do it. Right? So it's like your mom, Paula. Get the socks out of the dryer. Okay. Paula Jean, get the socks out of the dryer. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Paula Jean, Lawrence, you better not. Here, here, mom. Here you go. If my mom says it once, 
She wants me to do it. She wants me to hear what she's saying. If she says it twice, she wants me to hear it and get it. Like, I'm telling you to do something. You better stink and do it. But if she gets all three of those names in, and she says it a third time, I better be booking it because I'm going to, not only did I get it from her, I got it when she told my dad when he got home. So that's why I learned, if you don't like getting in trouble for doing stupid things, don't do stupid things. I learned that really early in life because I got it twice. That's the truth. <laughs> good listening skills and good discernment of truth. Yes. All right. So God is saying, what has he been saying? He said those two things. Don't, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid about these things. I am with you, right? And he's saying that a lot. Okay? He even says it in the New Testament, kind of in that way. We've also been hearing a lot of the same of joy, cheer, exalt, bless. He's wanting us to read it, to get it, and to do it. Start reframing that mind. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13 says, Beloved, this is another one of those that you have to listen carefully because it keeps going and going. Do not be surprised by the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon your testing, as though some strange things were happening to you. Well, this is weird. I never thought that would happen to me. Wasn't expecting that. Do you know a trial is going to come? Do you know God's going to get you through it? So they're saying, don't just act like, I didn't, this is weird. Why did that happen to me? Okay. Which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange things were happening to you. And then 13. And I love this. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that you at the revelation of his glory may, rejo may rejoice in exaltation. Now, this is one thing that we don't talk a lot about in church, and I don't know why. It's not one of the hot buttons. It's just a concept that we, keep, that we kind of forget and we kind of overlook, but it's one that is so important to our Christian walk. So it's saying, don't be surprised. Don't give me that, why me? Why is this happening to me? Don't get that attitude. Remember, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Here's the part we don't talk about enough. We can share in Christ's sufferings. Think about it. Jesus chose to leave his throne in heaven, to come down here to earth, fully God, as a baby, fully man. Right? We talk about that part. He chose to come down and become fully man along with being fully God. So that we, so that he, I'm sorry, so that he could experience what mankind would go through. He came down from his throne to put himself in our shoes so that when he made all these promises, he knew what he was getting self, himself into. He knew the promises he was making. He knew what it would take to carry us through this life. Right? He chose to experience that for a better understanding. He chose to do that so that he could live a sinless life by choice, and by his father's strength, he called on him a couple of times, to take our sins. He had to be sinless. He had to be that sinless, perfect sacrifice to take our sins, right? Therefore, when we go through trials, oh, and then he was what? Beaten, killed, mocked, not in that order. Well, yeah, because today he's mocked, right? 
the injustices that were done to him, the intolerance that he took on. Does it sound a little bit about some things that we're going through in these days sometimes? What a privilege. The Bible says, when you become a Christian, take up my cross and follow me. Do you know all that it go, goes into taking up the cross of Jesus? You have to die to self. Well, my feelings were hurt. My feelings are dead. To me, but alive in Christ. Right? So we have to die to self when we pick up that cross. We have to be imitators of Jesus. If we are going to be imitators of Jesus, let's understand the suffering that he went through. Let's share in the sufferings that he went through. We don't do that very often. We don't talk about that very often. That's a really important part of our Christian walk. Taking up his cross and sharing in the sufferings of Christ so that we can better appreciate what he did for us and what he is continuing to do for us. If we don't experience in that, you know, if we don't go through all of these trials, do we act like we need God? Do we act like we need to depend on him? No, I got this. I'm strong enough. But when we go share in Christ's sufferings, it's like, okay, I get it now. I get it. We can have a full appreciation of what Christ did for us. So all of these truths come down to this. We will face hard times. No rose gardens promised. Whether you follow Jesus or not, the rain is going to fall on all of you as well as the sunshine. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that's a whole other sermon, all of us, all of them promise to be with us. None will abandon us. Jesus' love makes all the difference. Listen to the story. I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to read it just so I don't stumble, okay? I was just going to tell it to you, but I'm just going to read it. Haley's mother was a single mother who was addicted to drugs. As, when Haley was, as such, when Haley was born, she too was addicted to these drugs. Her, Haley suffered many physical deficiencies as well as being nonverbal because of the drugs that she was born into. Haley attended a child care when her mother was working. Almost every day, Haley would have a meltdown and become physically out of control. It took a lot for her caregiver to get her into the office, but once there, she'd sit in the rocking chair, she'd rock Haley back and forth, who was still continually thrashing about, and she'd begin to sing, Jesus loves me, or Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves Haley. Yes, Jesus loves Haley. Yes, Jesus loves Haley. The Bible tells me so. One day, Haley had a particularly violent, traumatic breakdown. And it was all the work care worker could do to get her in her office. But she finally did. She's, Haley's flailing all around. And the caregiver got in the rocker, sat down. And before she could start singing... Nonverbal Haley, with tears streaming down her face, looked at the caregiver and said, Sing to me about the man who loves me. Jesus' love makes all the difference. So, to the believer, I say, We have clear instruction. Some of us may need to have an attitude adjustment from time to time. Some of us may, need to, be do, may uh, need to do better at encouraging others who find themselves in hard times. Some of us need to keep on pressing, pressing toward the mark with a song in our mouth. And all of us need to identify with Christ in his sufferings. And maybe just stop once in a while and say a big thank you. Thank you. For the non-believers in the room, I would say it's never too late. Until it's too late. No man knows the day or the hour which Jesus will return. Not even him. None of us know 
what our last moment alive is going to, when it's going to be. So I say, it's never too late to come to the Lord until it is. Then you're back to the sheep and the goats. Guess which one the non-believer will be? The righteous or the the unrighteous? The love of Jesus that makes all the difference was demonstrated on the cross when he died for our sins so that we could inherit eternal life by grace through faith, faith in believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, believing that we all have sinned and we all need to be rescued. So my final thoughts are, we all in this room will face hard times. Do you want to go through it alone on your own strength? Or do you want to invite Jesus to walk through it with you, never abandoning you, providing rest for being your tower of refuge? We are going to take communion. So with those that are going to help, if you could come up. While they're coming up, could you just kind of be in an attitude of prayer and think about Haley's story and think about the power of Jesus' love that just by hearing about it over and over, just by hearing about it, was able to verbalize, I want that love. So just close your eyes for a moment. Think about that love that makes all the difference. Then I'm going to pray. And when they've re- oh, I need one. Can I take one? And then when they return, we'll take the elements together. So go ahead and pass them out. Go ahead. I'll, I'll pray while you guys are passing out. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Thank you for the suffering that you chose to go through so that I could live a life destined to be with you forever. Thank you for asking us to transform our minds and our way of thought so that we could better be imitators of you. In these moments, Lord, in these quiet moments, I would just ask that as we prepare to take these elements that you have asked us to do in remembrance of you, that our first love for you would come pouring, pouring back into us. Not a little trickle, but your love poured into us, which the Holy Spirit has done for us, Lord. May we experience that first love and keep it strong and vital and vibrant in our lives. May we always remember the sacrifices that you made for us, your broken body, your spilled blood. May we always remember as we take communion, Lord, that we have a hope, our faith, stacking all the little dolls together, ends up in hope, the hope that you are who you say you are, the hope that you will do what you say you will do, the hope that you are coming again. So for all of this, Lord, we humbly say thank you. And let it be real in me. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you, if you're new to this, you can take the little red tablet out. And then open your juice.